Hey, feeling good, like I should. When in Durku, walk around the neighborhood, feeling blessed. Let's take a look at the homework uh, problems 9394. Uh, for this particular homework, your task is to rewrite each fraction as a percent, and if it's given as a percent, then convert it to a fraction in simplest form. So two fifths, uh, if we want to change that to a uh, percent, we need to change the denominator into a 100, so we would require multiplying 2 over 5 times 20 over 20, because 5 times 20 is how you're going to get your 100 in your denominator. And once we have this written as a fraction over 100, then the numerator becomes your percent. So this is equivalent to 40%. Working in reverse, 45% literally means 45 out of 100, or 45 hundredths. So uh, we would look for the greatest common factor of 45 and 100, which is 5, and we divide the top and the bottom by 5, and you get 9 over 20. So, you know, we use the giant one a lot for rewriting uh, to be equivalent fractions, but really the giant one process is also used to divide the numerators and denominators so we can simplify fractions. So 45 hundredths in simplest form is 9 over 20. 120% is going to give you a fraction that's greater than 1 because 120%, 120 is greater than 100, right? So, same as we did with B, we would write 120 over 100 and then identify the greatest common factor of 120 and 100, which is 20, and divide the top and the bottom by 20 to give you 6 over 5. And then the last one gets a little bit trickier because we need to figure out... Um, how we're going to convert a 40 to a 100. Now, you could have done this. You could have just taken and identified that 100 divided by 40 is 2.5, and then multiplied 21 times 2.5. That will absolutely work. Let's just prove that. So our multiplier, 100 divided by 40, is 2.5. So when we now multiply 2.5 times 21, you get your 52.5, and that would be fine. But I wanted to show here, no, 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 I wanted to show here how there's a different way that you can do it. You can do cross multiplication. See, if, if these fractions are, are not friendly fractions with friendly denominators, it's really hard to find a giant one that works. Like, for instance, if this was 21 over 37, what are you going to multiply times 37 to give you 100? At least 40, you're multiplying it times 2.5, which is a nice terminating decimal, but you don't want to have to deal with repeating decimals as your multiplier. So in that situation, if you can't easily find a giant one, just cross multiply. So 40 times x is 40x, and 21 times 100 is 2100. And now when you solve for x here, what do you multiply times 40 to give you 2100? It's 52.5. And you can see the work of doing the division there. That is another way that will always allow you to get the answer, okay? It's based on the idea that any time you um, have two fractions that are equal to each other, let me give you a really simple example. One half and three six are exactly the same, right? They're equal to each other. It's just one half is in simplest form. If I cross multiply, I get... Go back to there. I get one times six is six, and two times three is equal to six. So the cross products of any two fractions that are equal to each other are always going to be equal. So with that in mind, if I say, all right, let's take one half and say that's equal to x over ten. Well, you know that's going to be five over ten, right? Because five times is the same as one half. And you can see that you can multiply 2 times 5 is 10, so 1 times 5 will be 5. So let's just go ahead and cross multiply anyway and get 2x's is equal to 10. What do you multiply times 2 to give you 10? The answer is 5. Right? So, this always works. So I highly recommend students using this process anytime you're dealing with fractions or numbers that are a little bit more complicated and it isn't obvious what the giant one should be. 
Uh, Marissa's drawing coins for a bag. She's got five pennies, four nickels, five dimes, and two quarters for a total of 16 total coins. So that's going to be your denominator because when we're figuring out probability, the total always goes on the bottom. So what's the probability she will draw a nickel? Well, there are four nickels, right? So it's four out of 16. And if we're going to write this as a fraction, we want our fraction to be in the simplest form. And we need to convert it to its decimal equivalent. And remember, you can change any fraction to a decimal, 1 divided by 4, by doing the division problem. And then changing from a decimal to a percent is just a matter of moving your decimal place to places to the right. So the 25 hundredths literally means 25%. If one penny, two times, and one quarter are added, that means that you're adding four more coins for a total of 20 coins. So what was added? One penny, so this is now six. Uh, two dimes have been added, so that's now seven. And one quarter has now been added, so that's three. So what is the probability of drawing a nickel? Well, the number of nickels hasn't changed, just the number of coins. This is now 4 out of 20, which is simplified down to 1 fifth. And if we want to convert 1 fifth to its decimal form, we just do 1 divided by 5, is 2 tenths, and 2 tenths is the same as 20 hundredths. So 20 hundredths, by definition, means 20%. So in which situation is uh, Marissa more likely to draw a nickel? Well, when you add fewer coins, you had a 25% chance of drawing a nickel. When you had more coins, you had a lower percentage. So situation A is the one where she has the higher probability. She's more likely to draw a nickel with only 16 coins in the bag as opposed to 20. All right, calculate the mean of the data set. Um, in order to find the mean, we're going to add all of these numbers together. They all add up to 32. There are four numbers, so 32 divided by 4 gives you 8. It does say, can you find any shortcuts that would allow you to find the mean without having to do the calculation? Um, this is kind of interesting here, how, you know, different students come up with different explanations here. Uh, but think about this. If you took 2 away from here and made that an 8 and add that 2 to this one, then they're both 8. Do the same thing here. That becomes an 8, and you add it to this one, and all of a sudden you got four eights. So the average is going to be 8, right, since every single number in the data set are 8. Do the same thing here where you take away one of these and add it over to here, and you've got all 12s, and your average is going to be 12. This one is not so easy to do that with. A and B, sure, we could probably do it with those two, but this one probably just add all the numbers together and make sure you're at dividing by six, right? A lot of times students see those zeros and think, well, those don't count because they're only zeros. But they do count. You're adding the zero to the five, to the four, to the eight, to the zero again, to the seven. So you're adding six numbers together. Even though two of them happen to be zeros, they're still part of the data set. So you have to divide by six, and the average is four. Okay? All right. If Let me put my little guy down here. Change to a nice color. If five slices of pizza cost five dollars and fifty cents, how much do two slices cost ten slices and half of a slice? Well, this is a situation where it might be good to take all right, five slices by fifty. Well, how much would it be for one slice? So, in order to find the unit rate, you would do the division five. Divided by 5 gives you 1, so $5.50 divided by 5 will tell you the price for each slice, for each one. And that ends up being $1.10 after you do the division. So if that's the unit rate, then you can use that, multiply it times 2 for $2.20, multiply it times 10 for $11, and then take half of this for $0.55. Cents. And then adding fractions together. Is this our last problem? Yes, it is. Adding fractions together, you need to have common denominators. So this one is the only one of these three problems that have common denominators. So you just add straight across in the numerator, and remember, you keep your denominators. 
okay? That's very important for when you're adding fractions. We're trying to figure out how many total fifths we have. Now, let me draw you a picture of this to demonstrate why we keep our denominator the same. Get two circles. If I break each circle into five equal parts, And in this circle, I shaded, let me use my crayon here. I shaded one, two, three, four fifths. And in this one, I shaded one, two, three fifths. The question that we're asking here now is how many total fifths do we have? And so we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fifth pieces. So the I or the Fifths are telling you what unit of the fraction you're working with. These are basically saying you got four one fifth pieces plus three one fifth pieces. And if you think about this in terms of algebra, think about what we would do here. If you said you had four x's plus three x's, does everyone agree that you would have a total of seven x's? Well, up here, if you've got four one fifth pieces and three one fifth pieces, that's the same as saying you got seven one-fifth pieces. And what happens when you multiply seven times one-fifth? You get seven fifths for your answer. Okay. So, you know, when you're adding fractions, there is some logic to why we do what we do. Why do we have to keep our denominators the same when we're adding fractions? Well, this sort of illustrates that. Um, and it has something to do with distributive property. Um, I'll go into that a little bit deeper in a future lesson, even though it's not really a part of the seventh grade curriculum. A lot of times it's good for students to see the rationale, the reasoning, why we have to do things the way that we do them. All right, so that was for B. Didn't require any changing of our denominators. Here, we've got uh, 3 eighths minus 1 sixth. So, you know, it's like, it's kind of hard to take away six from eights when you're dealing with those individual pieces, right? So we, what we would want to do here is take your eight equal parts, and you've got a total of three of them shaded in, right? One, two, three. And here you've got six equal parts, And you've got only one of those shaded in. So what we have to do is we've got to figure out, all right, we need to pick both of these into equal parts for the exact same size. So if I cut this into three parts and cut this into four parts, each one of those smaller wedges would be a total of um, they would be 24th pieces, right? So if I cut this into three equal parts, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and I cut these into four equal parts. One, two, three, four. Oh, you know what? We're subtracting. We're not even adding. Okay. Uh, but let me just show you that this would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. If we were adding these fractions together, it would be a total of 13 24 But technically, what we're doing is we're taking away. So we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and if I remove four of those nine, you're left with five 24th sized pieces. Okay, so that's the logic of why we're doing what we're doing here. Uh, but what you would do is just get a common denominator. You could have done the coat of arms and change it so your denominators were 48, but the least common denominator is 24. So you multiply this times three over three, and you multiply this times four over four, you end up with 9 24th minus 4 24 which is what this was illustrating here. And that leaves you with 5 24. And here, you might as well just go ahead and do the coat of arms because your least common denominator is going to be the product of your two denominators. So 5 times 5 is 25. 9 times 1 is 9. And then multiply them together to get your common denominator. 25 minus 9 is 16. That's our answer in simplest form. All right? All right. So what, how much time did that take? Ooh, get up to 15 minutes. So I always try and make them under 10, but sometimes I just like teaching. You know, the homework is a teaching process just like going through the lesson. So um, you're welcome. All right.
Uh, get on to the next lesson. Take care. Bye. Hey, feeling good. Like I should. Winning the war.